this is going to give you some idea of who Richard Wright was at that point. Okay, go for it. <laughs> To protect myself against playing questions about my home and like my life, to avoid being invited out when I knew that I could not accept, I was reserved with the boys and girls at school seeking their company, but never letting them guess how much I was being kept out of the world in which they live, valuing their casual friendships, but hiding, and keeping me self conscious but covering you with a quick smile and a ready phrase. Each day at noon, I would follow the boys and girls to the corner store and stand against a wall and watch them buy sandwiches. And when they would ask me, why don't you eat lunch? I would answer with a shirt on my shoulder. Oh, I'm not hungry at noon, never. And I would swallow my saliva as I saw them split open loaves of bread and line them up with juicy sardines. Again and again, I vowed that someday I would end this hunger of mine, this apartment, this eternal difference, and I did not suspect, suspect that I would never get intimately into their lives, that I was doomed to live with them, but not of them, that I had my own strange and separate role, a role which in later years would make them wonder how I had came to trip. Now, 
even this many years later, and say, right on, right on, right on, right on. And one of the things he said, let me just read you two little sentences from it. You won't have trouble with this. He says, Negro writers must learn to view the life of a Negro living in New York's Harlem or Chicago's South Side with the consciousness that one sixth of the Earth's surface belongs to the working class. Negro writers must create in their readers' minds a relationship between a Negro woman hoeing cotton in the South and the men who loll in swivel chairs in Wall Street and take the fruits of her toll. Okay? See, he had that kind of sharp, clear analysis of what was wrong with the world. He wanted you to have a worldly view. He wanted you to see globally, you know, in your perspective. And he definitely wanted you to see the class dimensions of what was going on. And all of this is just right. You know, there's nothing about that you could argue. The only problem, though, is that when Wright looked at black people, Basically, what he mostly saw and almost all he could see was the ravages of historical oppression. He saw how much black people, we as a people, had been damaged by our experiences. You know, somebody uses the phrase oppression oppresses. <laughs> That's what he could see, you know. And so when he looked, basically, what he saw was a culture that was diminished, you know, depressed. Okay, so here we are, looking at this from the perspective where we are today. We have these two distinct points of view. On the one hand, we have Harlem and Sons, what they thought they were doing. And on the other hand, we have Richard Wright and how he looked at that. So what do we make? You know, what can we learn when we kind of see these opposing points of view? The first thing that we can learn is that Richard Wright's perspective came from who he was and his own particular life experiences. I mean, that's true for all of us, right? Huh? And when you try to understand anything, that's one of the first places you look. Okay, so Mark is going to read us another. I still had no friends, casual or intimate. and felt the need for none. I had developed a self-sufficiency that kept me distant from others, emotionally and psychologically. Occasionally, I went to house rent parties, parties given by working class families to raise money to pay the landlord. The admission to which was a quarter or a half dollar. At these affairs, I drank homebrew beer, ate spaghetti and cheerios, laughed, talking to black southern born girls who worked as domestic servants in white middle class homes. But with none of them did I confide. Emotionally, I was withdrawn from the objective world. My desires flowed, loosely within the walls of my consciousness, contained and controlled. I did not act in this fashion deliberately. I did not prefer this kind of relationship with people. I wanted a life in which there was a constant oneness of feeling with others in which the basic emotions of life were shared, in which common memory formed a common past, in which collective hope reflected a national future. But I knew that no such thing was possible in our life.